uh, good morning. Thank you for coming to this session on uh, theories of behavior change. I'm Carrie Ritz. I'm a AAAS fellow in the Geosciences Directorate at NSF, and I'm an archaeologist. So um, I'm working on interdisciplinary and international programs and hoping to facilitate more social science involvement over the course of my fellowship. So our session today, um, the theme of our session today is how and why people do or do not change behavior. And this has been something that has been studied for decades across multiple disciplines, as we heard in the keynote. Our speakers in this session will present an overview of the most prominent and current theories that underpin behavior change uh, efforts crossing the individual, group, and sociocultural scales and perspectives. We have two speakers in our session, uh, Dr. Amy Best and Dr. Irina Pegina. Is it close enough? Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, Dr. Best uh, is going to give a talk entitled Sociological Perspectives on Behavioral Change, and she's a sociologist and professor and chair of the Sociology and Anthropology Department at George Mason University and affiliate faculty in the Center for Social Science Research. She received her PhD in sociology from Syrac Syracuse University and has held numerous faculty positions at both Syracuse University and George Mason. She's the founding director of George Mason University's PhD program in public and applied sociology. And her research focuses on the study of youth and child well-being, social inequality, and youth identity formation. She's the author of 20 plus articles and books, including Prom Night, Youth, so Schools, and Popular Culture, and Fast Cars, Cool Rides, The Accelerating World of Youth and Their Cars. Her forthcoming book is Fast Food Kids, Youth and Changing Food Landscape of School and Home. Um, and our second speaker, Irina, I'm going to uh, <laughs> try not to butcher your last name again, um, is a social psychologist who applies behavioral insights and social science methods in the development and implementation of federal policy. She's currently a fellow on the White House Social and Behavioral Sciences team, uh, had previously worked on the energy and environment portfolio for Senator Michael Bennett, conducted postdoctoral work at the Center for Green Building in the Rutgers School for Planning and Public Policy, and completed her doctoral work at New York University. Her research focuses on climate communication and approaches to uh, foster adaptive responses to ecological dilemmas. And her dissertation was entitled The Challenge of System Justification for Acknowledging and Responding to Environmental Dilemmas and Climate Change. She's the author of numerous peer-reviewed articles. So uh, I think uh, Dr. Best will be our first speaker speaking on sociological perspectives on behavioral change. Well, good morning. It's so nice to be here. Um, so behavioral change is part of any policy toolkit, uh, whether directly or indirectly. Um, but I think that most of us would agree that behavioral change is tricky. Um, it can be often be interpreted as a means of control. Top-down approaches often fail. Um, it can be seen as overly moralistic um, and come up against a populist mobilization because of the presumption of contesting lifestyles, and it can produce unintended consequences. Um, and so we proceed with caution. So I'm a sociologist, um, and I've become increasingly interested in policy-relevant research in the last decade, though I was really trained to do basic research. Um, and much of this has to do with the role that I played in bringing into being this public and applied um, program, which attempts to train students in the theoretical and methodological foundations of the discipline but also linking empirical inquiry to policy um, and practice so that they can um, ha have the skills to sort of address a range of, of public problems that our um, social institutions today are um, confronting. Um, okay, so my work resides um, within the interpretive traditions in sociology. I primarily focus on youth well-being, schooling, and consumer markets, and mostly use qualitative approaches to inquiry, including ethnography and interviewing, and I'm gonna talk about um, studies that link to behavioral change using those methods in particular. Um, so there's several points of sociological relevance that are important for thinking about behavioral change. First is understanding behavior itself. Sociologists tend to think in terms of theories of action over theories of behavior with attention to action in contexts, often cautioning against too narrow a focus on individual behavior. 
sociologists look at patterns of behavior among large ag aggregates of groups, um, but more as the sum, um, just the sum of its parts. So the behavior is less a property of individuals, but arise from a complex of social processes as individuals interact with his or her world. Now this compels attention to situational, institutional, and structural conditions for action, right? Um, as well as paying attention to social definitions and interpreted practices as guides for action. So sociologists have long troubled the notion of behavior, beginning with an early critique of behavioralism for its lack of attention to how stimuli was handled through interpreted processes that then inform response. Action is symbolic, it is patterned by meaning, and meanings arise in social contexts. Um, sociologists sought to gain some distance from um, policy focused on behavioral change, um, mostly in the 1960s, um, and shifted away toward more structural explanations and calls for institutional change, in large part out of a response to the culture of poverty theories that gained traction in the 1960s to explain in the intergenerational transmission of poverty among black urban poor, um, and, and linked it to the sort of tangle of pathology um, and saw it as an expression, poverty as an expression of, of black culture. Now, sociological accounts of culture are much more sophisticated today. Few sociologists talk about culture as a way of life or a set of norms or values that guide behavior. A focus on theories of action over behavior arguably is the legacy of American cognitivists John Dewey, William James, George Herbert Mead. A pragmatic view of behavior understands people, um, how people live their lives in practice. Right? It directs our attention and focus toward the affective dimensions of behavior, the emotional ener energy of collectivities that produce the flow of motive. Um, the importance of collective symbols, rituals, and membership are emphasized over rational action of individuals. Sociologists in this context pay attention to different repertoires of meaning and then their practical consequence, right? So for example, caffeine is associated uh, with work in, in a US context. We often think about caffeine consumption in terms of sleeplessness, keeping us up. Um, in, a, in a European context, caffeine is, and coffee consumption is highly ritualistic. Um, it tends to be associated with convivial action and sociability, um, and is associated with leisure, and thus doesn't have the same kinds of consequences, um, so that the cult of decaf is, is really a, a much more strictly American phenomenon. And this really has to do with the ways in which um, objects, coffee, are handled through an interpretive process, whereby meaning is assigned to what, um, what its value is. So a rich field of examples within sociology have relevance for understanding the social context that enable and constrain efforts to create behavioral, behavioral change. Um, so the sociologist Thomas Vanderbad, um, who wrote the book Getting Wasted, um, examines binge drinking on college campuses. Um, binge drinking is um, a, a set of behaviors that correlate with a host of negative outcomes. So he examines binge drinking in terms of collective drunkenness, drunkenness um, and inverts the usual college drinking as problem frame by asking why does it feel good to be bad or what are the pleasures of deviance. He draws from a branch of sociology that emerged in the 1970s that sought to reframe deviant behavior by focusing on the lived experience of criminality. Being bad has its own reward. He direct attention, directs attention to the, the um, emotional gains of shared drunkenness right, and asks what is gained from this, and, and argues that it was a chance, drunkenness is a chance to, um, shared drunkenness, is, provides a chance to project a, junk, a drunken self, um, which is a self that is a less disciplined self, a less demanding self, that collective drunkenness provides a break with the boredom of modern life, and that the collective energy of shared drunkenness produces a whole new world of possibility, what he calls drunk world, an interesting place to visit, unpredictable and serendipitous, brimming with various kinds of collective supports in the face of crisis. When you're throwing up over a toilet, it's your friends who pulled your hair back. <laughs> <laughs> but from his attention to the collective dimensions and gains of drunkenness, he realizes that, in fact, interventions to, re to actively stop drinking are unlikely to, um, to work very effectively. And in fact, most of the strategies on social norming that have occurred on campus have had mixed results. Um, and, and calls, in the end, ultimately for harm reduction strategies, um, which means enlisting 
the folks who, who live in drunk world um, to engage in a range of um, harm minimization. Right? So how people define situations in the context of everyday life has enormous consequences on behavior. It's the definition of situations that guide action. This is well captured in Howard Becker's seminal Becoming a Marijuana User. Becker treated being high as a collective experience that involves learning to enjoy, enjoy the effects of being high, the dizziness that comes with it, and to define being high as positive. Those who didn't define it as a condition of, of the condition of being high as positive and recognized it, that they recognized that they were in fact high didn't become regular marijuana users. So what then are the contexts in which behavior change can occur? So sociologists begin with situational and institutional contexts. With regard to the situational, it's useful to um, remind us of Irving Goffman's reversal of perspective in his pronouncement, not men in their moments, but moments and their men, suggesting that it's the structure and definition of situations that guide behavior. Situations construct individuals, not the other way around. Boswell and Spade's work on the situational determinants that were conducive to an increased likelihood of sexual assault on college campuses reflect the value of situational analysis for explaining behavior. So they looked at fraternities and they distinguished between high-risk houses and low-risk houses using observational research much like Vanderbilt as well as interviewing. And while both high-risk houses and low-risk houses had alcohol consumption, there were fundamental differences in the situational structure of the houses. Right? So the situational structure of the high-risk houses were marked by uneven gender ratios, limited seating, loud music, and dirty bathrooms. And this combined lent themselves to a situation of collective dehumanizing of women and increased reliance on interaction rituals that generated high levels of in-group solidarity and out-group exclusion. What was most meaningful in their findings was that young men from low-risk houses changed their behavior dramatically in the high-risk house context so that their behavior came to reflect the high-risk house behavior. So in addition to situations, sociologists recognize the role of institutional mechanisms for promoting specific types of behavior. Victor Rios is punished also a book based on ethnographic accounts and interviewing, um, looks at the youth control complex and the hypercriminalization of youth through community institutions. He examines how youth criminal trajectories and the greater likelihood of joining gangs is patterned by what he calls the under-policing, over-policing paradox. Community institutions, the kinds of supports that they provide, youth have outcomes for the ways in which youth attempt to resolve and respond to the precarity of their situations. Right? In poor urban communities marked by violence, youth use violence preemptively to prevent their own victimization as they respond to the precarity of the situation in the absence of community supports. So the over-policing and under-policing has a tremendous impact. And that this is compounded by criminal labels that are assigned to youth, particularly youth who are poor and of color in these areas. The consequence of criminal labels in the absence of community support where youth's lives, were with their, are, where youth are not recognized as victims themselves, creates the, contributes to the formation of a deviant self-concept um, for these, these youth, giving rise to a feeling of nothing to lose um, that then set the condition for um, attempting to resolve their own, um, well, the dangers that they confront, right? So they engage in what Elijah Anderson calls the code of the street, which is an eye for an eye um, system of justice um, that prevails in the absence of other kinds of justice systems um, that serve as protections for them. Right? So the final example I wanted to give is an example of behavioral change shaped by a situational and institutional change um, that relates to positive health behaviors. Um, and this is, some, this is my own research um, that I'm doing with a graduate student, Jeff Johnson. Um, we've been studying um, a nonprofit organization in DC. Um, we collected data in 2012, and we're back in the field again this year, um, that runs programs that promote um, community health through dietary change, specifically in low-income communities. So limited access to healthy foods in low-income areas is well documented as part of the new hunger in the United States, characterized by easy access to processed, uh, highly processed, nutrient-poor foods and blocked access 
to foods that sustain well-being, the new hunger has been linked to public health, has been linked in public health and social science literature to obesogenic environments, defined as both um, food and built environments that produce obesity. So low-income communities are at a disproportionate risk for being obesogenic environments. Now, community-based efforts to bring locally sourced fruits and vegetables and lean proteins to low-income communities at um, affordable prices in the form of farmers' markets have been offered as one strategy to improve healthy food access, especially in communities where a protracted period of financial disinvestment has left residents with a weakened food um, infrastructure. So, so, so this is something that prevails um, significantly in Ward 7 and Ward 8 in DC. Yet farmers' markets in low-income urban communities have experienced uneven success, suggesting improved access alone is not enough to create behavioral change. Situational meaning matters. The characterization of farmers' markets as expensive or as signaling impending gentrification combined with the legacy of marketplace discrimination for low-income Americans, especially African Americans, helps to explain the struggles of farmers' markets in underserved communities. In response, mobile farmers' markets have developed as an alternate community-based intervention to improve healthy food access. There are about 40 mobile markets operating in the US currently. Since they are single sellers, they move very easily across community hotspots, but thereby expanding the reach of their selling power. Their base of customers tend to be EBT, SNAP, WIC, senior voucher users, and they have very low operating costs. Early evidence suggests that mobile market patrons consume more fruits and vegetables than their non-market counterparts. Mobile markets are especially effective when combined with educational outreach. Now, Jeff Johnson and I have been collecting observational data on the mobile market stops um, that are run by this, by a, a, this nonprofit, um, and with the aim to identify um, healthy retail market um, best practices that promote dietary health at the community level in communities marked by um, both food insecurity and limited food access. Now, at first blush, building market demand in an area where access to fresh fruit and vegetables is severely limited would appear to be relatively straightforward. You go in, you set up shop, you sell some food. But there are many obstacles in launching such a program. The shortage of grocery stores in poor communities often contributes to a sense of ambivalence in market options. Groups and organizations from outside the community intent on positive impact run the risk of being perceived as interlopers. Program activities can be met with suspicion or be interpreted as patronizing or disingenuous. Yet there are also ways a, pro a new program can mitigate these obstacles. Findings from our 2012 study of the mobile market um, found that they were able to build market demand by harnessing community-based networks, with city-level administrative offices and grassroots organizations. <coughs> Market sites were anchored by trusted community institutions and had a high volume of SNAP, WIC, and senior voucher participants. They ran an effective community outreach campaign that helped to solidify partnerships with food access and community stakeholders, resulting in a matching program so that low-income customers could receive $20 worth of fruits and vegetables for $10. This made their food very affordable. But there was also strong evidence of reciprocal relationships of respect and care with customers, that situational component, which combined with food sampling and cooking demonstrations to create an effective environment of skills learning and awareness about health and the food system. Mobile market success relied on trust funds. That is the everyday work of building social trust and the mutual recognition of collective and individual dignity by staff of its customers something that's regularly denied to the poor in their daily lives. Some people have suggested that poor people prefer drunk food over fresh food, um, which presumes that preference is, food preference is actually what shapes behavior. Our, our observations find these explanations wanting. Policy work and practical interventions to increase access to and consumption of healthy foods have not focused enough on why people participate in particular kinds of markets and its links to the affective gains and the emotional energy that they derive from doing so. Situational dynamics matter. Right? The consumer experiences for a large number of black Americans in particular is marked by a well-documented legacy, legacy of hostility, humiliation, and indifference that persists even today. Accounts of black customers being refused service, sold inferior products, often at inflated prices, being followed by security, being denied entry to retail settings are numerous. The accumulative effect of these re routine encounters is guarded apprehension and distrust by customers. 
But the mobile market that we observed offered a fundamentally different shopping experience. The rapport building rituals of market staff, their shame reduction strategies that they engaged in, enabled customers to ask questions openly about food and cooking preparations. Cooking demonstrations were particularly effective in promoting healthy eating habits. They introduced customers to new food with noted impact on customers' perception and appreciation of unfamiliar vegetables and fruits. Staff valued the food knowledge of customers, often asking them how they prepared food at home. Customers shared stories, memories, and existing knowledge they had in the context of market exchanges, with noted reference to a not so distant agricultural past. Much of the food sold at the market honored the distinct foodways of their customer base, with culturally rooted staples of southern soul cooking, such as collards, mustard greens, green tomatoes, butter beans, and sweet potatoes. Gradually, we came to appreciate that shopping at the mobile market was a kind of belonging, a way to claim membership in the larger community. Exclusion from consumer spaces often means exclusion from the broader lattice of public life and contemporary life. So this is well illustrated. I'll stop because I'm about out of time, but I wanted to um, conclude with an example, one example from the field of an old black woman who, as she was perusing potatoes and apples during the, uh, during the market, asked, what is these? And she was pointing to Swiss chard. And one of the staff um, explains to her what it is. And she says, I'm trying to eat healthy. Um, and then commented that she had not eaten healthy for, for the bulk of her life, and that she had had bad habits in her 20s and 30s. Her phone rang, and she answered it, talked for a moment, and then with clear delight in her voice said, let me go. I'm at a local farmer's market. I'm buying fresh and buying local. There was something gained in the, the participation and the belonging that this market enabled her to have. Since the launch of their market in 2012, the mobile market program has grown substantially from seven market stops to 18. More than 60% of their first time um, customers are SNAP customers, um, and they became, 60% became return customers. And the market has grown by 50% each year, um, almost entirely through word of mouth strategies by customers. Um, in 2014, they sold over 20 tons of local, sustainable, grown foods and vegetables at re reduced price to a mostly low-income customer base. So the takeaway points, the success of the of mobile market occurred within the context of broader mobilization around food, food for sure. Um, there's a very diffuse food movement that has set the conditions um, for behavioral change. Um, but it's important to understand the important role of the community stakeholders and partnerships um, with community stakeholders. Um, but more importantly, it's, that it, it's key to understand the important role that um, meaning, collective action, and ritual plays in driving action so that the market was effective at changing the structure of the situation under which black folks who are poor shop. And this has led to meaningful behavioral change. We're back in the field now trying to see what kind of change has actually occurred over, over time. I'll conclude there. Thank you. I think we'll just have some questions at the end so we can keep the talks going. Well, we should have plenty of time. I'm a fellow, I was a fellow last year, and I'm still sort of a peripheral fellow, and it's, uh, I sat in those you know, seats so many times, it's nice to be up here. <laughs> um, so, um, I'm also a social psychologist by training, you know, <laughs> um, we know each other, and, um, but I've been working in, in federal policy for the last couple of years, and so I thought in this talk what I do is um, take some of the stuff that I've been seeing and, and um, running up against in my work and try to sort of funnel that into a talk that maybe would be helpful for you all as practitioners, which I'm thinking probably many of you are. So I won't go into the kind of detail that I would love to about some specifics of the studies that underlie this, but try to distill the, the sort of takeaways that maybe would be applicable um, in your work. 
So I want to start with this quote, which points to um, two tensions. One, that there's change that happens around us and to us, and change that we need to internalize and, and take into ourselves. And also just the tension that, that Amy brought up about what does it mean to be trying to implement change to other people's behaviors, and that's something that I'm going to return to in the middle of the talk. So I'm going to talk about why people resist change and the reasons, the serious reasons um, that underlie that. Take a critical look at attempts to change other people's behavior, and then talk about some of the ways that have been helpful in facilitating behavioral change. So how are people affected by change? Well, we know that change is hard on people. Um, if you think about personal domains of change, life transitions, um, changing careers, having a baby, these are some of the most challenging, typically, times in people's lives. They're also the biggest times of opportunity. Again, as Tim mentioned, that those are times to really change people's stories, um, develop new directions as we're changing anyway, but they tend to be really difficult times and times that require a lot of support. If you think about community and group and organizational levels, again, if you think about mergers or such, those are times of the biggest challenges for organizations. Um, and at the systemic and institutional level, again, change is something that um, is often dreaded and sort of creeps in um, on the scene for a while and then when it catches up with people can be um, really tough. And so if you think about um, the collapse of the Soviet Union, which is one of the most vivid exam modern examples of a rapid um, institutional social change, uh, one of its side effects was a decrease in seven years in the life expectancy of men, a lot of it through um, suicide and also early death, which is larger than, than the life expectancy drop in most countries that go through war that takes place on their land. So we're talking about the fact that when you upend the system that people are really embedded in, that can impact them on a very, very deep level and really have to require them to change everything about how they think about themselves and their, and their lives. And so something I work a lot on, that the area I come from is working on climate change, and it's a very interesting example because not only it's a change that's coming in a sense from the outside, but that we are causing from the inside, and that will require all of us to change at every level. And so it's something that we'll be seeing in almost every domain of our work. And I think it's really important to think about both how, how do changes come in, what does it mean for us to mean things to align with those changes. Now again, return to that. So what are the ways in which people actually resist change in, in practice? So at the behavioral level, people are really structured by behaviors and patterns. So we, um, we do things in the way that we're used to doing things, and that's a tremendous source of support for us. It's not just a problem. It's the way that we navigate the tremendous amount of decisions that we have to make. We tend to want to make a decision once, figure out what we want, and then just stick to it so we can move on to other things. And in addition, when we're really good at something, when we're used to doing it, we have a sense of fluency and flow. And that gives us a really deep sense of satisfaction. And to interrupt that can be quite challenging. At the cognitive level, I'm going to start out by asking a question. This is my favorite question to ask in classes. What do you think is the most limited human resource? Cognitive resource. The most limited cognitive tool that we have. Yeah. Equal time, yes, <laughs> I mean, it's true, in fact, it's related. Reasonableness. Reasonableness, <laughs> maybe some people more than others. Attention. Yes, attention, thank you. So the most, <laughs> um, we have incredible cognitive resources in almost all domains except for attention. It's very limited and it is the, the weak link, the, the boundary around um, what it is that we can do. And so because it's limited, we end up coming up with all sorts of tools to navigate reality in ways that don't require us to pay attention. So we have heuristics, meaning shortcuts that we take through various decisions that allow us to know what to do without having to think about it. We have preferences for the status quo, for the way things are, for the decisions that have already been made, so that again, we wouldn't have to think about it. And when we do have to think about things, when there's some sort of an internal conflict that happens, we have to first experience a great deal of internal dissonance before we'll actually pay attention to it and come up to, with some sort of a new decision or way of doing things. So this is powerful stuff. And then at the motivational level, so the level of emotion and need, the goal that would drive our behavior, we tend to have very powerful needs to feel good about 
ourselves, basically, and about the way that things are, both personally, but also in terms of our groups and organizations that we're part of, and the larger system that surrounds us. And the reason is that we are invested in these things. They are our well-being, and we are very motivated to protect them from threat and to really justify the kind of larger ideological systems that we're embedded in around which we've built our lives. And so we have a strong motivation not to question them and not to change them because it causes us a lot of distress to do so. And finally, just to mention that the proclivity to resist change really um, differs across individuals and aligns with other personality characteristics like our need for certainty and our need for control over our environment. So that said, people don't only resist change, right? Sometimes there's a desire and a lot of support for change. So the most sort of obvious recent example is the political campaign of Barack Obama, who really saw the need for um, social level change as his base, his inspiration, and the, the need in, that he was going to speak to in the public. Um, and oftentimes, change is an opportunity for growth and development, somewhat more so when people are younger than later in life, but not necessarily. And, and again, as Tim was saying, it has to be, especially specific moments, it can be very powerful. Um, some people hold values and norms that really align with change. Um, it could be both in terms of one's um, desire for sort of unfolding the world, but it could also be a general proclivity to progress that we hold in America as a general notion. And sometimes it manifests in funny ways, like if you think about um, the need to update your wardrobe and such, right? We think of that not being able to do so is actually sort of taking away from our freedom and um, capacity to be ourselves. Again, there are some personality characteristics that make it more likely for some people to want change, need for openness, need for new experience. Um, and then in terms of um, how, what, it, what facilitates change in line with these needs, it's really the setting of goals in such a way as to really, um, uh, as to really manage all of, those, uh, all of those barriers to change. And I'm going to talk more about those in a second. Um, with, uh, before I do that, I want to bring up a few critical questions that I think practitioners really need to ask themselves before they delve into using the tools that are out there to bring about change. So first of all, to think about these barriers and why people have them, but also to ask these questions. So the first one that I think, and I work right now as part of a team that, that implements policies or helps to improve policies in the ways that does often lead to behavior change, and so I try to ask myself this question constantly. Should I be trying to change other people's behavior? Where am I coming from? Who am I? What is my position? Who am I talking to? Why is it that change is necessary, et cetera? So really be critical about my role in this process, and I want to encourage you all to do that as well. Um, so who are we to ask other people to change? Um, and, and importantly, what are the underlying reasons for their existing behavior, like I was outlining? Are there historical, cultural, community, personal reasons? Those reasons are not random. It's not, these are not just mistakes. Behaviors come from somewhere. We have to respect people's origins. Um, and then what is the meaning and the narrative that this behavior has? Again, connecting to the talk that you just heard about, what is the story that these uh, behaviors are embedded in? And then if change were to happen, what would be its costs? You know, change has a has an emotional cost, a cognitive cost, but often also social cost insofar as the behavior is part of some larger framework. And if you change one piece, how does that reverberate with the rest of the system? Um, and uh, what do people really need? And, and importantly, is this the right time for change? Perhaps sometimes the right time it's it's the right time to support people in their process rather than to to push them towards something new, and sometimes the time, in fact, is right for change. Okay, so that said, um, I want to talk about some of the most prominent um, approaches to behavior change that are out there. So the first thing to say is most, behavior, most uh, behavior change efforts I've seen in the government have to do with information. And we know from so, so many sources that that doesn't really work. Um, information is very important if people don't have the right information, that certainly needs to be corrected, undoubtedly. But rarely is that enough to really bring about behavior change because there are many other reasons why people aren't doing something. So the other efforts that are prominent are to change attitudes and perhaps values, but primarily the target is attitudes. They are important, but in the end, certain people's behaviors tend to align with attitudes. Just because we change attitudes doesn't mean we necessarily change behaviors, 
because there are other barriers, there are other steps between what a person thinks is right or thinks that they, that they should do and the ability to actually implement a behavior. And so we're going to talk about some of those in a second, but those really need to be addressed. If you are intent on changing attitudes, then choose attitudes that are as close to the behavior as possible. So we call them sometimes behavioral intentions. The intention to really engage in a particular area of behavior because then you're getting closer to the behavior itself. There's less barriers in the way. The thing that I um, think is really important to, to target for behavior change are needs and motives. Almost all of human behavior is driven by needs. We don't really like to think, we don't like to change our attitudes, but when we need something, we tend to make it happen. And so you really have to understand what the underlying needs are that are driving the behavior, and then once you have a sense of it, understand where it's really coming from, and can you create a situation that both meets people's needs, but in some way also brings in some other behavior that you may find to be um, important. And the other um, extremely productive uh, approach to behavior change has been that of using social norms and identities. So social norms are um, the perceptions of what is the right thing to do and the desired thing to do in a particular situation. And we are creatures of our social context. Our need to belong, that was going to be my other question to you, but I guess I wrote it down. Our need to belong is our most powerful human motive. To be excluded from the group that you're part of is possibly the most painful experience that a person can have. And so people go far, far out of the way to align um, with what's going on around them, with what their group requires, with what is perceived to be the correct and the desirable thing to do. And so that is something that is extremely useful to harness in trying to bring about groups, in trying to bring about change. Um, and we can think about that as happening at the very minute level. Um, in terms of, like, think about yourself walking into an elevator. Um, everybody knows how to stand and how not to stand in an elevator. If somebody's doing something wrong, you'll know it immediately. Um, and we do that instantly, right? We come in and we see how people are dressed and how they're talking to each other and what you know, voice level are they using, and we, without even giving it any thought, align to their behavior. And I'm going to talk more about creating the right context in a second. But then the other level of setting social norms is at the level of leadership in institutions. And if you do have access to sending those kinds of messages from above, it's not a question of forcing people to do things. It's a question of setting examples and leaving it up to people to follow those, those examples or not. But I encourage you not to underestimate the power of setting those norms. Um, another area that, that I think a little bit less about, but that's coming to the fore recently, is that of morals, which is very related to both needs and motives, to people's um, identities and institutions they're part of, and those larger um, sort of underlying ideas that those institutions promote. And so this is why you needed to upload these slides this morning. Um, this morning, or rather today in Europe, um, the, Pope, the current Pope Francis came out with his encyclical on climate change in which he calls, he really underlines the connection between the moral call for people to be stewards of the environment and our responsibility to stop um, doing what we're doing to bring about climate change at the industrial and, and technological and also at the level of our practices. And so the New York Times writes, advocates of policies to combat climate change have expressed hope that Francis could lend a moral dimension to the debate because winning scientific arguments, um, I should say, is different from moving people to action. So I think they got it right on. It's not just about information. You really have to organize people's thinking with these larger notions of ourselves and that sending that message from above really works. So um, narratives and stories, I will say nothing more. <laughs> I feel like I couldn't possibly compete. Um, and then the last thing I want to tell you about, and I know I'm probably almost out of time, is the role of context, which is something that's a little bit less perhaps psychologically fascinating, but it seems to be extremely practical, practicable in a policy context, and something that I've been working with a lot as part of the social media and sciences team. So context really matters, and of course you're talking about that as well, because decision making often is not a rational thoughtful process. Because of all of our cognitive biases and heuristics that I mentioned, we tend to really respond to the contextual and peripheral, peripheral factors that surround our decision making and behaviors. 
And as a result, the way that choices are presented to us and the kind of framing around them makes a really big difference. So here's an illustration. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so I'm just going to give you a brief outline of how context can be worked with, which is at times the most accessible thing in a policy context to try to draw on these tendencies. This is a framework developed by the behavioral insight team in Britain, it's called EAST. So the first thing is, whenever you want to support the, the uptake of some sort of behavior, make it easy. Make it easy for people to achieve their goals. Again, if we're stressed, we have limited resources. If it's not easy, we're not likely to do it. So one of the key ways to do that is set your defaults correctly. Whatever it is that you're designing, make sure that the default choice is the one that you want people to do. A perfect example is different states have different policies about what happens if you, God forbid, die in an a car accident. Some states, by default, on your license plate, it says um, that you, can, you will donate your organs um, if, if you die. And then you can uncheck that box when you sign up to get your license. 90% of people stick to the default and don't um, change that option. Other states, the default that's checked is I will not donate my organs. 90% of people, again, stick with that choice. Clearly has very little to do with their moral relationship to uh, organ donation. Um, the other thing is simplify the process. We know that um, about at least a fifth of first generation college students who have an intention and have filled out a college application already um, and submitted it, fail to, to get through the FAFSA form. Okay? That's a shame. That shouldn't be happening. So that's the kind of thing where the complexity, the unnecessary complexity of a decision made of, of the structure decided on at the, at the policy level causes really bad consequences. So make it convenient. Um, make it attractive. Draw people's attention to your messages. Um, make it something that is novel, surprising, salient, but most importantly, relevant and interesting and also interpretable. Um, and make sure that, uh, that, um, that it's speaking to, to people's actual proclivities and what we tend to pay attention to. Again, motivate people through our social connectedness, use social norms, use various kinds of um, incentives for cooperation, reciprocity, et cetera. And then very importantly, make things timely. So oftentimes people commit to engaging in behavior that they would like to, in fact, engage in, but all kinds of things get in the way. Set up reminders or cues that come in at exactly the right time, or some kind of intentions that again enter at the right moment to remind people of what their desires and commitments were. So these, these tools are really trying to get at that disconnect between what it is that we want to do and maybe have even committed to do, and the actual doing of it. And again, just to point out that larger scale and even intentions aren't always enough. We need to think about the process of carrying through engaging behavior and support people there. Um, so, in sum, understand why change is hard, um, ask critical questions about changing behavior, and take people's reasons for, for the behavior they currently have very seriously. And to support behavioral change, really focus on people's needs and motives and goals. Think about their social context, their social milieu, their, the norms and identities that they, that are deep, deeply seated in how they think about themselves. Think about this, the systemic and institutional context that shape um, our decisions and our behaviors. And try to make the behavioral context as conducive as possible. Thank you. So thank you speakers for those engaging talks. And I think we have about 10 minutes Right, exactly. I think that's a really great point. And so 
the way I tend to think about it is that we really need to take people's movements very seriously. People are not the same. So even though I'm discussing these techniques in general, every person is unique. And yes, there are some tendencies, but overall, um, the key thing is really to take very seriously the, the backgrounds, the context, the preferences, and the underlying needs that people have. And sometimes those may be shared more so within one group compared to another group. And sometimes it may be unique, and sometimes it may be prevalent, even at a national scale. But I think whenever going into any sort of situation, the first thing to ask is, who are the people here, and what are their needs, and what are their realities? And I think that's why I try to be critical about this notion of behavioral change, because we are coming in as yet another person with our own set, with our own lens on the world, and we have to be very critical of that lens and put the people that we're working for, that we're trying to serve first, and take their realities very seriously. Yeah, thank you. Can I just add to that? Um, because, you know, if, if you're if thinking about community level change, um, I, I think community partnerships are really important. So it, it's about identifying the stakeholders within that community and then working collaboratively so that you're able to capture what are the particular contextual needs in play. Yeah. I, I'm, Second that, I think the idea is to empower people rather than to disempower them in supporting any kind of change, which is not an arbitrary thing. <laughs> a couple quick questions for, for Irina mostly. Um, you mentioned about the ways to behave of change, and you mentioned the attitudes and values, and you mentioned the needs and motives. <coughs> um, I remember reading once that the needs are something that are kind of not permanent, so once the need goes away, the behavior is not going to stick unless it's connected to the value, which is a value, personal value. So I'd like to come to that. And uh, another quick question is about providing information at the right time. Um, a lot of government and um, NGOs provide a lot of information on a website, which is what I call passive information. You have to go there and look for it. How do you make that information? available at the right time, so having people look for it. <laughs> um, <let's see. laughs> um, so yes, absolutely, I think values definitely um, are a, a more long-term or perhaps a deeply seated level of sort of the way that our, that we're structured internally, perhaps our parts of our worldview. Um, <coughs> And I would say that in a lot of ways, our values drive our needs. So a lot of our needs will come from them to, to act in a way that aligns with our values. So needs also will certainly vary in, in terms of how short or long-lived they are, right? So we can think of some needs that will have constantly on and off and need to you know, feed and sleep and all of that. But, um, I, but so I, I think it's, it's a little hard to say in the abstract. I think it's really in picking a very particular need or behavior that you're focused on that one can think about, you know, what is the most meaningful entry point, you know, and what is it that you really want to work with in this situation. So values, if they ever do change, will change in response to, you know, large life events or shifts in one's context, you know, um, in education perhaps or and things like that, but it, it isn't the case that we can or should really try to change people's values. Maybe uh, people seek out those changes. Um, whereas when we talk about needs, yes, they might be much more transient. But I think, um, but I think some needs are prevalent, and you can really think about the system of needs in that situation. And needs are also very much again tied to their context. So if you're really dealing with a particular behavior in a particular context, you really need to ask yourself, what are the needs right there and then that people are experiencing? So let me give an example that maybe would make this more clear. Um, I've been working, so I work a lot on like building stuff, efficiency, energy efficiency in buildings. So we've been thinking about light in, in, in buildings. Really interesting. So light is really important for people because we have circadian rhythms, and unless we get enough light, our body doesn't know what time it is, we can't sleep properly, our immune system goes down, et cetera. Light is also important to get into buildings because you don't want to be using electric lights when there's plenty of light outside. 
So, um, but the question is, but, but very often that doesn't happen. So why? Because in the work environment that people spend most of their time with and get most of their light in, they are staring at a computer. And what they need is to have no glare. <laughs> and so that need, which is prevalent every time they come to work, is really, really important in that particular setting. And so in, yes, they have a need for light. And yes, we have a need to mitigate climate change, but the very immediate need is to be able to see what's on your screen. And so unless you really address that need and think about the structure of your space and the orientation of your desks and the ways that you reflect the light off, you know, in, onto the ceiling rather than into people's faces, will actually allow you to make an adaptive change. And so that's why I think, you know, there's the larger scale needs and then there's the immediate situations. But whenever you're really taking apart a context, think about what's happening for people in the moment and where they and then you asked about information at the right time. I think it's the, the answer is the same. Think about, in, at the decision point, what is the information that people need? So um, I can give you another example. The Social Behavioral Sciences team did a project with income-based repayment programs. This is a really great uh, program that allows people who have college loans to repay them in a way that's tethered to their income so that they become an employer or underemployed, they don't go bankrupt, and they can actually pay less for however long they need to, and then you know, make it up later. So less than 1% of people take up that program. Why? Because when they received the information about this, it was, first of all, not coming at the right time, and also was not easy to understand. It didn't contain the specific information they needed. It was broadly talking about the program or whatever. So we helped them restructure their emails in such a way that it was sent when their payments were due and they were about to start you know, having all kinds of issues with not being able to pay. And then we gave them the information that was exactly pertinent for them. What, what would it mean for you? Who can you call? You know, and what will happen? And that increased uptake just from that first email by four times. So it's an example. Again, just think about what's happening for people in that moment. I think we have time for one more question. But we're about to go into a break. So I'm sure you'll have about 15 minute break and an opportunity to follow up with the speakers. <coughs> I, I've heard a lot of things about um, context and environment and the personal motivation angle. Could you could you speak directly to incentives? Where I work, we talk a lot about setting up incentives, but I haven't heard anybody use that word. And when does it work? What are the where do incentives work? Where do they where are they counterproductive? Uh, I you know I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure, actually. I mean, I think that there's some, that's one layer of trying to create some amount of change is to incentivize particular kinds of actions. So in the case of the, um, the mobile market, um, there were incentives by coupons, for example, to increase the amount that folks would buy, and they were pretty effective. So that was a financial incentive. Um, and so, but I would, I would put, put that in relation to a whole host of um, factors. Um, and again, for me as a sociologist, um, it's really understanding the meanings of motivation um, that are in play um, before identifying what kind of incentives would be the most effective. Um, so again, context really matters. Yeah. And are you thinking of financial incentives in particular? Yes, yeah, some, some kind of financial incentive or something, something that you want that you get at the end yeah. of the process. Yeah. So, Thanks for your question. I mean, incentives are commonly spoken about because up until not so long ago, social science in the policy space meant economics, <laughs> and um, still does to a large extent. And there's, you know, obviously incredibly useful tools. Um, but incentives are sort of a mixed bag because sometimes incentives are great, especially when you're introducing something from scratch that nobody knows about, or that there's some sort of well, certainly market barriers to their adoption. You can build some of those barriers through incentives, <coughs> like level the playing field, for example, for new technologies. But when you talk about human behavior, um, if you really have no motivation uh, to do something, then an incentive might be a way to attract attention to it, make it possible in a situation that wouldn't otherwise be possible, and sort of get the ball rolling on things. But we know from research that if somebody already has their own motivation to do something, whether it's because of a preference or some sort of contextual reason, 
if you then incentivize them, you might actually undermine their underlying motivation, and it's going to totally backfire. <laughs> and so that's a bad idea, of course. But then also, if you only incentivize behavior and don't somehow support it through other channels so that it becomes sustainable on its own, then you don't lose the behavior when the incentive stops. So, so incentives can be good, but I think that they need to be thought of as like a, like a supporting tool while you're creating a larger context that will be the, the basis for longer term behavioral change. And then yes, that can be one of your tools, but it in and of itself isn't really like a, a, a long term sustainable solution. Yeah, and, and again, depending on context, it's important to 